Hello, I'm Suzanne O'Connell and I'm a professor at Wesleyan University in Connecticut in the United States. And I'm gonna discuss 50 years in geoscience, how far we've come and how far we need to go. And I'm gonna use 50 years very liberally. So when we think about geoscience, we might say, who does geoscience? And I think most people would might have an image something like this, white men, probably not as well dressed as in this picture from the 1897 GSA meeting, but they certainly don't think that geoscientists look like this. And geoscientists do, these are all women geoscientists, many with families, some with pets in all different environments where they're doing geoscience. When we think of icons, the important people in our discipline, names like Darwin, Agassiz, Gilbert, Jaeger, people working primarily in the 1800s who helped to define our science. But do people remember or know of Mary Anning, a British paleontologist who questioned the way that the natural world was interpreted? Or Eunice Foote, who discovered that carbon dioxide and water vapor observed thermal energy and could cause climate change. A male colleague gave the paper with her findings in 1856 at a AAAS meeting, but it wasn't recorded. So I'm gonna discuss this situation with both data and stories, and I'm gonna begin with stories. And these are two men, Cesare Emiliani, the father of paleo-oceanography, and Maurice Ewing, who headed the Lamont Observatory and collected all kinds of marine data and cores that really helped to cement that plate tectonics was in fact happening. I never met either man, but both were seminal in starting marine geology. Now with this data that Maurice Ewing and his colleagues had, had collected, a person, Marie Tharp, who worked at Lamont, was able to make this map of the seafloor with her colleague, Bruce Hazen. But this is largely Marie Tharp's work, physiographic maps showing the middle ocean ridge, the spreading centers, the transform faults. And people have often don't even know that a, a woman was behind this remarkable achievement. And equally remarkable is just how good it was. So here's on the left, a physiographic map of the Canary Islands from Marie Tharp's work and a recent swath mapping map of the Canary Islands today. So you can see she had the continental shelf slope rise, she had the continental boundaries. She had done a remarkable job. So let's move forward to what these two men did. And what they did was Cesare Emiliani wanted to core many places in the ocean. And he had a project called Loco, Long Core. And he needed a ship and Maurice Ewing rented a ship, the Calderal One, and they began coring in the Eastern Atlantic. They got about 14 cores and other oceanographic institutions joined them and they formed JOIDES, Joint Oceanographic Institutions for Deep Earth Sampling. And after their initial work, others came, became involved and a special ship, the Glomar Challenger was built specifically to get cores of the deep sea and the deep sea drilling project was formed. And here's a, a picture of the Glomar Challenger here. Now in the deep sea drilling project, which went from 1968 to 1983, there were 20 or 96 legs, two month each for each expedition. In the second leg, two females got to sail. They were micropaleontologists. And this was at a time when many institutions didn't allow women on their own vessel. All the crew were males. Three females during this period of time served as co-chief scientists, 1.5%. That is a dismally low number. And you can see as we move up into the, the 80s, there was not a research or insurgence of, of women co-chief scientists. So let's talk about my own experience. When I was an undergraduate, of course, all the faculty were male, but in our department, there was a woman who I never met, Helen Foreman, and she had sailed on the Glomar Challenger. 
And the male faculty would talk about this in hushed and reverent tones. And I knew this was a very special experience. And so it was always in my mind, the Glomar Challenger, sort of this you know, amazing vessel. Fast forward a few years and I started working on a master's degree mapping Ophiolites in Newfoundland. And while I was working on in my field area, a group called the Advisory Panel for Ocean Crust Drilling, this was part of Joides, came through my field area. And you can see these are the members of that panel here. Not all of them were on the field trip, but talking to them, I learned about an opportunity to become the Joides Science Coordinator. So I applied and I got the job. So here I was, Joides Science Coordinator. It was a two-year position. It rotated between the different U.S. oceanographic institutions. And in my very first month there, I was introduced as Jim's Gal Friday. Now, prior to my taking the position, everyone in that position had had a PhD. I didn't. And I could tell there was just a different level of um, respect. And I thought it was because I didn't have a PhD. So what did I do? Right after working for Joides, I immediately enrolled at Lamont to get a PhD, where I again used deep sea drilling sediments from DSTP Lake 96. Um, while I was there, of course, again, all the faculty were male. And in one of the meetings in the, I don't know, early 80s, there was a discussion about a position and did they want to try to hire a woman. And one member of the faculty, and this is hearsay, but I think it's pretty reliable, got up and said, no, we don't want a woman on the faculty in this department. And so they didn't hire a woman. Although now the director is a woman and they've even had a woman chair of the department. So from there, I continued my scientific ocean drilling odyssey and became a staff scientist at the ocean drilling program. And this was a great few years there was a whole bunch of us, men and women, fresh PhDs, all really excited about what we were doing and about ocean drilling and what could be done. The problem was that it was in College Station, Texas, and my husband lived in New York. So I applied for jobs and I got this job, my first choice. I was so thrilled at Wesleyan University where I've been for over 30 years. And even though I'm at Wesleyan, I still go to sea, I still study, study sediment cores, and so do my students. But I was the first woman in our department and also the own, first and the only woman in our department, physics and chemistry. There were no other women on the faculty. And I can tell you it, it was rough going, but I survived and I'm totally committed to diversity of all sorts in our science. So let's look at some data. So let's look at the data from the deep sea drilling project, the very beginning, and the International Ocean Discovery Program, the program that's on, ongoing right now. So in the deep sea drilling project, every expedition, they were called legs then, published a volume that looked like this. You've probably seen them on libraries. And in the front material, they listed people and various institutions that were involved in both the the planning and the funding of this program. And uh, so here's from an 1890 version. And you can see in blue, I've highlighted the US institutions. And all these blue in blue means that these were all headed by men. Fast forward 40 years, 2020, look at this. Green means that the, the organization is headed by a female. So we went from 18 in 1980 from zero women, females in charge to 2020, 50%. I think that's something we can all feel really good about. Um, in DSDP, as I mentioned, 1.5% of the co-chiefs were females. In the last 72 expeditions, 33% of the co-chiefs have been females. And if we look at a subset of this from 361 to 3. 90, 393, half of the co-chiefs were, were females. And throughout this I, I, ocean drilling, IODP, many expeditions have had both co-chiefs be female. So I think this is really a lot to be very proud of. And um, even though these numbers might look odd, what happens sometimes is because of weather problems or equipment, the legs 
are drilled in sequence. So let's look at some more data. Let's look at the Academy data. And I think this is a really important graph. And for those of you who saw picture of scientists, this is Nancy Hopkins graph showing the number of women in, of, in all the faculty at MIT. So we can see in the early 60s, there, was, there were one or two women, so around 1%. By the time we get to 2006, the year of their study, it was about 15%. And the number has risen significantly after that, and I'm sure it's rising today. But what I think is important when we see this is that there are large periods where nothing is changing. And I think that's because no one is pushing. So I think we really need to keep pushing to enact change in what our geoscience community looks like. So here's NSF data showing the PhDs awarded to women since 1980. In pre-1980, was there were less than 10% of the PhDs earned by women. By 1986, it was about 20%. Took a while, but by 2020, 30%. And then a quick rise to 40% by 2006. Clearly, it's not a linear uh, trend. It goes up and down, but the, definitely the trend is in the right direction. And right now, it's 49%. So we're very close to parity. But what happens to these women who get the PhD? So here we're looking at a, an eight year period from 1996 to 2004, where women were getting, you know, in the high 20s, early 30% of the PhDs. So are they entering the academy? And the sad answer is no. So at these three different time intervals, four years apart, assistant, Professors are shown in blue, associate in orange, and full in gray. Now, we all know that in the academy, most people spend their life in as full professors, decades, many decades. And so what we have here is um, a gradual increase uh, in the women assistant professors, but nowhere near the number of women PhDs that are being generated and really concerning is if we look at the associate professors, in this eight year time period, the number of associate professors who are female did not increase. So that says that either women were not um, wanting to go on or they were denied tenure. So something needs to be done. And one of the things that was uh, being done at the time was the NSF advanced program. And my colleague, Marianne Holmes and I, ran a workshop called Where Are the Women Geoscience Professors to look at why there weren't more women, what, was, what were their perceptions, and then what could be done to educate department chairs and faculty about um, changes that needed to be made. And the good news is that in 2019-2020, 26 percent of all geoscience faculty are female. I don't have the breakdown. But we know that this is where most people are. So there's lots of female full professors right now. Another really good uh, situation. So what changed? What, how, how are we able to make these, these changes? I think three things were important. One is more people, females and males, speaking up and recognizing that it was not a situation that would change on its own. It needed a push. The ADVANCE program was started. And ADVANCE is not about fixing the women, but about transforming the entirety of the institution so that both women and men faculty can thrive. And then funding, large amounts of money, millions of dollars were available to address this issue and move inclusion forward. And if NSF wanted to spend this kind of money, clearly it was important and it got people's attention. Of course, we are far from done with justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think the next big challenge for the geosciences is involving diver diverse students. And this is a picture I just love. It's from GSA meeting in 2012. And all five of these students worked with me, four of them with ocean drilling uh, sediments. So they're part of the ocean drilling community. All still are involved in geoscience. And I love that they arranged themselves in this view, just like the men behind them, which were all white men, and showing that we can make changes. And these, these 
students will go on and do that. So as we move forward, I think we all have to keep pushing and we can do it. And I wanna thank you for listening to this talk.